What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of JAR. JAR, for those of you that may be new, stands for Joe. And Amy. Review. This is our weekly show where we review the magic stories. And this week we are here for the mid-part finale, I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, it's um, you know, the halfway point of this 20-chapter story. Chapter 10 of The Gathering Storm by Django Wexler. And it is... A big deal it's kind of what we've been building towards with the guild summit and so my quick review at the top is this one was great it was shorter I think than I expected it to be maybe it just went so quickly because I was enjoying myself but I felt like it was shorter than the other ones have been not in a bad way by any means but just noticeably shorter in my opinion um, and it was uh, it was great I mean the the dialogue was fantastic the characters were great, and there were a lot of them. I really enjoyed this one, and I highly recommend it. Yeah. Okay. I didn't feel as strongly about it, but okay. it was definitely good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you've read any of this story and or uh, the War of the Spark novel, um, this is a big story point for both, to be honest. I mean, Absolutely. if you're aware of um, Assassin's Trophy, right, with with the the that story spotlight and the death of Isperia, this is the thing that makes that happen. So I highly recommend you read it. And that's just in general, if we liked it or if it's a, a, a big story point, we encourage you to go read it because we're not fully summarizing it here. We are reviewing it. So we encourage you to go check that out first and then come back here and come hang out with us because we would, we would love for you to do that. Uh, quick plug up at the top, please do not forget we have a brand new channel. Uh, this video is coming out on Thursday, the day before this, our third episode of our new series, our one of our two series on our Video Games for All channel is up. Uh, feel free to check that out. I'm sure it will be linked at the end for all of you, but uh, we encourage it. It's a lot of fun, so you should really go do it. It's uh, a good time. But uh, for that, let's go into the full review itself. As I said, it is the beginning of the Guild Summit, um, and even going in, this is just the stuff I love. So again, maybe that's why you weren't as excited about it as I was, or, or sorry, you weren't as hyped up about it after the fact as I was, but I love hearing from the different characters, hearing their opinions, hearing their voices, right? We're not, it, it's not a, a, an omnipotent perspective. We're not in all of their heads. We're only in one person's head at a time. In this story, specifically like Rawl and Veraska at different points. Um, and so when that is the case, you don't get the inner workings of people's minds, all of their minds, but you do get outwardly what they're portraying. So we got to hear from all of the different guilds here one way or another. And I love that. I love hearing from titled, named characters, hearing their motivations, their likes, their dislikes, their angers, etc. Um, that's, I don't know, that's the kind of thing that I live for. So even going in, I knew that this was going to be great because it really is setting up. I mean, it, it's it's every single guild leader that you can think of or representative like Hikara, for example. Um, it didn't seem like Vanifer was there from the Simic. It just seemed like it was a representative from the Simic. Um, and even though they were kind of especially, like, ornery uh, yeah. in, in this one, um, not not necessarily wrong one way or the other. It was just something that I noticed that they were kind of the ones being all angry about the way that things were going. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I, I did feel, though, that the characterization <clears throat> felt right. Oh, yeah. As Fair. opposed to feeling wrong, which is what it normally feels like at this point. These days. These yeah. days. But not as much with Django. I know you've mentioned a couple of times previously in, in these chapters that you felt that things were a little off, but I would say those were outliers as opposed to par for the course. Right. Right. And so you're right that it's something that I think we're much more alert to at this point. Right. Just because it's like... Okay, in all the other recent stories, it's been real bad, but I think, uh, you know, for credit where credit's due, I think Django and or um, his, uh, the, the people who he was coordinating with within the story team um, did a good job in this story of characterizing the 
even like minor esque guild members uh, well here. Mm -hmm. So, good point. Um, speaking of the the guilds, first of all, I thought it was really funny uh, in my head the way that it was described. All of the guild leaders showing up, it really seemed like um, it was like a red carpet event. Mm -hmm that everybody was showing up to, right? Like, the Simic show up in their, like, octopus car thing, and everybody, like, all the people are cheering for them, and the guards are, like, trying to hold people back to, like, open up a little pathway for them to walk past. I thought that was really interesting and kind of cool that, like, they're like rock stars, right? They're like leaders of guilds, and their fans or their groupies or whatever you want to call them are out outside of the, um, of New Prov waiting to see them and cheer them on at this big event that's going on. So, yeah, I, I don't know. That I was something. they're not groupies. <laughs> um, and then we see a bit of the tension among the guilds. Uh, before anything even starts, we see it with the Gruul in Borborygmos and the Boros in both Aurelia and the uh, Minotaur, the female Minotaur that she brings with her, uh, where Borborygmos is just kind of upset and makes it known that he's upset because i mean come on he's cruel of course he what isn't he going to be upset about um although as we have learned and i thought it was super interesting um he showed up which yeah. is he's not something right <laughs> that's not a gruel thing and it, it, at the towards the end we learn from the translator um that borborigmo showed up as like a favor to niv mizzet almost and basically, like, now Rawl is screwed because Borborigmos is very upset with Rawl that this all fell through. Especially because, as we learn, right, Borborigmos is not loved uh, by the rest of the Gruul at this point because he went to this meeting. And so it's like, look, now I've got to face a bunch of challengers. I, I came to help you out. And now it makes me look bad that this didn't work. Right. So now I've got to go back, you know, tail between my legs, so to speak. I don't believe he actually has a tail. He's just a cyclops. But still, tail between his legs, he's got to go back, and he's going to have to deal with the consequences of what he decided to do. But, um, I, again, like you said, it, it definitely says something about the fact that he was even there in the first place. Right. Um, so there was tension there between the Gruul and the Boros. There was a bit during the actual discussion, the actual summit itself, uh, there was some obvious tension between the Simic and the Azorius, where the Simic were basically saying that they didn't trust the Azorius because it was being held in their guild hall and they were the ones who benefited the most from right. this meeting and, and the cooperation of all the guilds, um, as well as the Boros, specifically the female Minotaur, kind of calling out Lazav of the Demir and saying like sure we should just trust this spy and Lazav you know who who is dismantling his guild and Lazav's like yeah we needed some changes you know something to that effect and it was like that's interesting that you know this is this is the turmoil that we've been hearing about and seeing bits and pieces of and now you're just flat out seeing it even in what's supposed to be like to a degree, peace talks, right? That's not exactly what it is, but to a degree, it's at least cooperation among the groups for this one um, kind of coalescing moment for all of them. But, so. I mean, it, the Game of Thrones happens regardless of whether it's during peace talks or not oh, with yeah. the other nation. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just kind of the way it is. Right, and... Um, and oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, I mean... Considering, I would say that the effort that was put forth <laughs> for the peace talks was actually uh, better than expected. Well, and the way that, I mean, arguably in situations like this, the way that it's supposed to work is you would hope that these guild leaders are voicing their distrust, their distaste uh, for these situations because they are, if you if you compare it to real world politics, they're supposed to be advocating for their guilds and what is best for their guilds, and more importantly, hopefully, their the people within those guilds and their interests. And so, you would hope that anyone that is speaking up, or you would expect, I should say, that anyone that is speaking up and saying we don't like this or why is this happening or stating distrust for whomever 
is doing it to kind of say like, well, how does this helps you and us in no way. Right. Like we're the ones sticking our necks out, but what do we get for it? And that's a completely fair and reasonable thing. And if we want to compare it to real world stuff, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more later as well. But yeah, that was, uh, that was something that, you know, stood out to me is that, that at the end of the day, they're, they're like politicians and they're supposed to be kind of advocating for their constituents, if you will. Um, again, that's somewhat in an ideal world, <laughs> I guess, but that's how it's, I guess, supposed to work. Um, then we get at the end of this first section, because obviously all of these stories really are, are being broken up, um, not just by chapter, of course, but by um, like kind of delineating like lines separating either changes in perspective or passage of time or big events. And it's just that like pause moment. And the ending of the first section was uh, a big shadow flying over and kind of filling the room. Um, and it's cool because there are a couple of different options at that moment. Oh my God, it's the Guild Summit. Is it Nicol Bolas? Well, that wouldn't make a ton of sense if you've read War of the Spark because like he doesn't show up at the Guild Summit. You still have to get to the moment where Veraska kills Isperia, but it's still a big shadow. Is it part of Rahl's storm? Is it, which is the answer, is it Niv-Mizzet? Like any and all of these things are what it could be. Right. Um, and it's still really awesome that it turned out to be Niv-Mizzet, but it's also cool that that's the moment where there's that delineation because, again, as we've talked about, the ends of these chapters, if this were a full, actual, like, bound book, the end of a chapter is typically a spot where a reader will stop for any portion of time because they have to move on with their lives or go to sleep or whatever it is that they need to stop reading the story to go do. And you would hope that the story is such that the, the chapter is ending, and I assume most authors, and I'm, I'm not a writer myself, well, I'm a writer myself, but I'm not an author myself, so I can't guarantee this, but I would assume most authors would want you to put down their book thinking, man, I can't wait to go back to this book to see what happens next, as opposed to just putting it down and being like, yeah, you know, and, and just being like, I'm bored now, you know, and going somewhere else. That just seems counterintuitive to me. I don't think that that is a stretch to to feel that that's what authors are trying to do with their stories. No, definitely not. Um, and so when there are these kind of clear stopping points of the end of a chapter or a delineating mark, you want to leave that last line prior to that logical stopping point as one that will make you want to read on to find out what the mystery is or what happens next or how this person fares or whatever. And so <clears throat> that was a really good way to end that section, despite the fact that it was towards the beginning of the chapter. And so you would hope that the reader wouldn't have to put it down right after this chapter, but you also don't, or, you know, right after starting this chapter, but you also don't know the, you know, it's, it's, it's a stopping point. And that is a way to uh, keep people reading on, which is, uh, I think, extremely important. So, and I think it was effective in doing that. Um, Amy... Would you like to talk about this section, because I wrote this down, <clears throat> Veraska, during a pause in the Guild Summit, Veraska is kind of on her own, and she's looking around this Azorius Tower, mm. and she's upset by the decor, she's upset by the feeling that she has here, both because of the environment and combined with the fact that it is the Azorius in and of itself, and the quote that she used, which I, I know you kind of had a, a big point to make with this, so I want you to take it after I read this quote. She's looking around at, at all of the employees, if you will, or the people in the tower doing their Azorius duties, and she says, The scratch of a pen sends someone to prison. A tick mark is a death sentence. What did you what did you think about that uh, quote? Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. It's pretty real. <laughs> yeah. I told you we'd be coming back to that real world <laughs> thing. <Yeah. laughs> it's um I think it's in there for multiple reasons. It's fair. Um the main 
noticeable reason, the reason that I think the author wants you to believe is the only reason, perhaps, um, is because it's for Aska, right? So that death sentence was on her. Um, and it was definitely a traumatic experience for her. Um, and she made it out alive uh, by becoming a planeswalker um, inadvertently. Right, and we, we find out more about that later as well. But yes, it's a good, it's a good like foreshadowing slash like further helping to explain why we get to where we get at the end. Right. Um, but there are two other reasons. And uh, one of the other reasons is because it very much harkens back to uh, a sort of medieval um, monarchy style government uh, where you have these, um, these, the leaders of the guild sort of in that respect can kind of represent monarchs mm -hmm. um, in the past, you know, um, historical monarchs that have existed in real life. Right. Um, not specific ones, obviously, but the concept, um, and 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 that that sort of thing um, was a was a big deal back then. You know, um, people murdering each other for uh, the power um, that comes with uh, murdering the current monarch, and they just replace the current monarch um, if they have murdered them. Um, but the fact that, you know, you can just yell off with their heads <laughs> and people are put to death regardless of whether there's a real reason for it, right? Um, <clears throat> because even back then, uh, for the most part, trials that occurred weren't um, in any way just. Right. Um, and the third reason is because... Um, because of how relevant it still is today. Because of how difficult it is for um, people who have been convicted of crimes to get out from under those crimes and those stigmas that come with those crimes, regardless of whether they even did them. Right. Um, and even if they did do them, um, they're not allowed um, sometimes in our society to um, change. They're not allowed to become productive members of society because society has shunned them. Right. Well, I was going to say they're not allowed to change in the eyes of the people who are making those decisions as to whether they have or not and or who are making the rules and regulations in terms of what qualifies them to have changed? Well, well, not just, not just their eyes. The eyes of the whole, right? Right. Uh, the eyes of society. <clears throat> um, and perhaps society's eyes is, are that way simply because the system is that way. And so we've all been conditioned to, um, believe that that's the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, especially in other countries, um, we live in America, if you were unaware for some weird <laughs> if reason. If that was unclear. Um, Northeastern U.S., if that is right. uh, also more pertinent to you in any way. Um, but uh, there are definitely plenty of other countries that are much better at um, sort of, I don't know, how you say it, recuperating? Oh, uh, ooh, rehabilitation right. is what you're looking for. Right, um, and, and um, there are probably plenty of other countries that don't have the death penalty, mm. um, so there aren't people who are not guilty sitting on death row. Um, whereas here, that is the case. There just are going to be people who will be put to death for a crime that they didn't commit. And there just are people who would rehabilitate and have good lives 
if they were given the chance. And um, I think I think looking at it the way that Veraska is talking about it here, if you are hearkening it to real world examples, mm -hmm. to me it feels like. To me, it feels like also looking at it from the Azorius perspective, if you're Veraska, it's just those people who are making those decisions and ticking those marks and, and you know, striking that pen or whatever, they're not taking the time to put themselves in the shoes of the person that they are making the decisions for and or even realizing that it's a person. Right. It's just a piece of paperwork in front of them. They check a yes or a no, and it's they a move name on. name or a number. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's very easy in that case and or in real-world examples to dehumanize the situation. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about appropriate rehabilitation and, and hoping that people can j rejoin society because that is, I, I you know, People will argue one way or the other. Um, one camp of thinking is people will tell you that that's what prisons were supposed to do. Right. There are other people who will disagree with that, and those are two different points of view. Right. And that's fine one way or the other, but that, that rehabilitation is what prisons were supposed to do in the first place, as long as it's not a life sentence without parole, because then, obviously, you're not trying to rehabilitate them, you're just putting them away because they don't deserve to be among the rest of society. But if you're letting them out at some point, presumably you want them to be better right. when they are released because that's the whole point. But just the idea of the dehumanization, the, the, the whole concept of if you are a number or a name on a page as opposed to a person in front of you, and even if there's a person in front of you, if you're of the ruling class or, or the decision maker in this case, you might just be able to look at that person and write them off because you're like, well, mm -hmm. it, what it says here is what you did, and so goodbye. And right. you don't give the person a chance to talk to you. There's also the trust aspect, right? That's a big portion of this story as well, is that... What is being proposed by Niv Mizzet during this council meeting or this summit could put a lot of power in Niv Mizzet's hands. And the point that somebody brings up, I feel like it was the Simic, but I also feel like they just, that's an easy thing for me to say because they spoke out a lot of, about a lot of things. Right. But something that, that somebody pointed out was that, you know, great, you want all this absolute power and then you're just going to use it to rule over the is it again. Right. You know, or, or continue to rule over the is it, and then they're just going to be the biggest guild, and all of us can go screw ourselves. Right. And Nimbus, it's like, well, no, I, you know, I would remove myself from that. But you'd have to take his word for it. Right. Because that's all that he, he's just saying words. There's no, like, he, he kind of harkens back to, well, the guild pact would still keep me down and prevent me from doing that. But that's clearly something that half if not more of these guild leaders don't fully understand or or the representatives in general because uh, uh, Lazav even mentions, you know, that's something that Tristani probably keeps close to the chest and Imara doesn't understand it despite the fact that she is the representative that showed up for the Selesnians because as we learned or will learn or are learning, uh, Tristani is a little busy at the moment uh, dealing with the fact that one of them is just not around um, or not conscious or whatever. Um... So it, it's also that aspect of trust where if someone, to, to go back to my original point, if someone is in front of you saying to you, I have changed, here is how I've changed, here is why or how I'm a better person, you still have to trust what they're saying. Right. And again, if you've dehumanized them, then trust is not a thing that you have for that person because you might not even still see them as a person. You just look at them as a criminal. Once a criminal, always a criminal. And that's unfortunate if the goal is rehabilitation. I don't know. I don't know if I cut you off way long ago and there was a further point you were trying to make at all, but... I don't think so. Okay, good. 
<laughs> that's good. That's a positive. If there was, I don't know where it went. Well, I mean, it's been a while, so that's fair. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> speaking of Varaska, because the, the, kind of the rest of this story is about her until we get back to everybody walking through the doors and then we're at Rahl. Um, there is a partial explanation in this story, at least that can be drawn from this story, as to why there was the infuriating retcon of the Varaska jace mind wipe situation. And that's because you need that... You need Jace to not be around for Niv-Mizzet to need this part of his plan to happen. Because otherwise, as was mentioned, Jace as the guild pack could just do that. Right. But he's not around, and so Niv-Mizzet is the one saying, we have to do something because he's not around. And without the guild pact around, we need a consensus from all ten guilds to come together and make this decision right. in in totality, to, to do the workaround or whatever. Yeah, I, I really loved the part where they were just like, um, where they they literally said that um, that it was gonna benefit um, the is it guild more to have the summit, and I was like. Okay, so they just don't even realize how much it benefits them to be able to at least to some degree um, compromise, uh, converse, uh, cooperate with the other guilds as they all live together. They're right. all part of the same plane, you know, and, and we're all sitting there going, they're all, you know, intrinsically connected by this magic. Uh, what am I going to do if they don't um, give consent to do something? Right. Right. Um, and then he comes up with an idea, you know, um, mm -hmm. but... I mean, the, the main point before he comes up with this idea is that the guilds working together is essential for them to exist. Um, and they all want to sit in their own little corner and uh, be happy, um, you know, that nobody's getting in their elbow room, you know. Um, or uh, button their nose into their business, uh, but that's no way to live. They can't just sit in their own little corners and never move and um, work as a, as a functioning society whole that they are supposed to be. Um, it, just, it just doesn't work. Any, uh, any Lost fans out there? Lost the television show? Jack says it really early on in the first season if we can't live together we're gonna die alone right yeah, it's it's true i mean you know it's it's a thing because not having the cooperation and the help and the um ideas from multiple people mm -hmm. uh, around you is is really what would have made them all die Right, and I mean, very briefly as well, right, you, you're, you're dealing with some pretty big egos. I yeah. mean, that, that kind of has to come with the territory of ruling over a tenth of a universe, right? Like, you know, to a degree. <laughs> like like the tenth, a tenth of a city-state in the way that that works. Um, but you have someone standing there and saying, well, he's impossibly powerful and no one could ever defeat him. And then you have somebody like Aurelia or somebody like Borborigmos who's like, uh-huh, sure. We can't defeat him. Right. Whatever. I have, for Aurelia, I have the entire Boros army on my side and I'm a freaking battle angel. I'm sure we'll be fine. Right. Borborigmos, a giant cyclops who has beaten back every challenger that has ever come across him to fight him for leadership of the Gruul. Right. Because he's a giant cyclops who's 
to a degree, intelligent enough as well. He's not just a mindless, like, you know, destroyer of things. Right, right. Same with him. There is no challenger that can beat me. I'm freaking Borborygmos. Right, and and how long did he say he was the the guild leader? Uh, that was uh, that was uh, Niv Mizzet, oh. who said that he was a guild leader for ten thousand years, but had lived on Ravnica for f had been alive on Ravnica for fifteen thousand. So a long time. And again, and Niv Mizzet is then the one saying he's stronger than I am. Right. I've been alive for 15,000 years. I've been the Perun of the Izzet Guild for 10,000 years. I know magic. I've faced challengers. And, like, kind of showing them all up, but at the same time doing it for a reason. Right. To say... To say, like, look, guys, you know, comparatively, yeah. there's no comparison. Yeah, exactly. Like, this dude is legit. <laughs> Stop sitting there, uh, you know, blissfully removed, mm -hmm. thinking that... We're all going to be just peachy keen right. because when he shows up, we're just going to flex our muscles and he's going to run scared. Yeah. That's not going to happen this time. This dude's legit. Yeah. And, and they just kind of don't get it. Well, and I don't blame them. They right. couldn't possibly understand an interplanar threat because some of them didn't know what a planeswalker in general was until however many days or minutes or hours or whatever ago, they didn't know what a planeswalker even was, and now they're, they have to understand that a, a, a planeswalker who has been around for millennia, I don't know, who has god, who had godlike powers, and we will find out, and they will find out, is trying to reobtain those godlike powers, right. is just going to show up and ruin everyone's right. day. Everyone's day. Because, of course, it'll be the planeswalkers, but it will also be the Ravnikans, because right. it's happening on Ravnica, and because that kind of stuff... the battlefield, right? Right, that kind of stuff doesn't happen without, you know, more problems. Right, so regardless of how little or how much the Ravnikans are actually in the battle, uh, they still have to clean up all the bodies. Right. And rebuild, and, you know? And, yes. And to go, to go, so something that I have harped on many times in these videos for The Gathering Storm. I'm going to say it again and, and kind of finish it off for here. I can see why now they needed the retcon for the Jason Veraska thing. Okay. That doesn't mean I like it. That doesn't mean it makes sense to me. I think that there could have been such a better way of going about it. But with the way that this story decided to play out, I'm sure that that occurred outside of the purview of the Allison Lourzes and the Kelly Diggses of the world, who were the ones who wrote those or came up with those Incredible Ixalan stories. stories. Yes, fair. Those, those Ixalan stories and the reasoning behind kind of doing that. And once they hammered out the details, they being the newer story team, once they hammered out the details of how War of the Spark was going to go, how Gathering Storm was going to go, it didn't really work out, and so they're retconning it which sucks because it's it was really the biggest thread going in and it just kind of and, went and away and it was arguably the most meaningful one right right because it it showed that because the thread that they chose to cling to where Liliana gets you know I don't know it, they're attempting to redeem her right in the eyes of the rest of the gatewatch it's just upsetting right so it happened. It's under. It's somewhat understandable as to why, because again, you needed Jace to not be around. You needed Veraska to feel like she was alone in this situation to get us to the end point. Which, by the way, that end point is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Veraska gets the note slipped under her door at night that says, "The conference chamber now, no guards." Now, when I read that and heard that she had gotten that and read that she got that, that note, what that meant to me was there were a group of people getting together in the conference room without their guards to kind of have their own secret meeting outside of the official aspect of the Guild Summit. I was very wrong. Um, oh, I knew what it was about. Oh, I didn't. I really didn't. I, I, when I saw that, I thought it was like, 
you know, when people are at a conference and they sneak out and have some debaucherous stuff going on at night, you know, when they're all hanging out or whatever, and they were all going to get together and have a discussion in the conference chamber, no guards, meaning like Amara had the two elves with her and Borborygmos had the little translator dude. So they all, like Veraska didn't have any guards, I guess. So I don't know. That was what I thought of. That was blatantly Veraska not what it was. Veraska doesn't need guards. It was, it was Niv-Mizzet, right? I mean, that's almost certainly, uh, unless it was Dovin Bun, which is also a possibility, I guess. Uh, I assume it was Niv-Mizzet having controlled somebody to slip a note under the door that said that, again, it could have been Dovin Bun who like kind of pulled the guards away to go do something else and that's why there were no guards. But regardless, it got Veraska into the chamber with Isperia to have her conversation, which by the way, <clears throat> I would like to say, and if you would like to say more about it, please feel free. But all I have to say is, if for whatever reason up to this point in the video, which by the way, thank you for watching up to this point in the video, no matter what, but <clears throat> if you didn't read the story, but have watched up to this point in the video, I recommend you go read that section. If that is the only section that you read, I highly recommend it. Because all I can say is, it was awesome. When I read it, when Veraska was saying it, uh, we learned a bunch of information. I feel like I wanted to see someone acting as Veraska, like an actor or an actress doing, a, an actress of course, doing an amazing job at Veraska in the full makeup and everything, talking to the Sphinx and just monologuing the crap out of it. I wanted to see the emotion. I wanted to see and feel the, the, the force behind it. Um, I pictured it in my head, but I wanted to see it visually in front of me as well. So that's what I got out of this. It was amazing. But yeah, I, I don't know that I could do it justice by saying much more than that. But did, yeah. you, did you have any points that you wanted to bring up about that section? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was really good. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have the issue that you had. I, when that note was there, I was like, okay, great. This is the point It's where, time, yeah. Right, this is the point where Veraska kills someone mm -hmm. because she's not going to die. Right. And at that point, you know, when somebody says no guards, what that means is, you know... I, I want to make sure I can kill you, you know? Um, so when you do show up and you kill them yourself, um, it makes for a good story. Yeah. At the very least. But I like, I like that she got that catharsis of confronting Isperia, saying all the things that she wanted to say, calling her out for all of the nonsense that she went through, and then... I think the I tough. Was I was shocked when Isperia said what she said. I was not. That's the interesting thing. I was not. And again, maybe it's because I'm an Azorius at heart. According to Isperia, she felt that the decisions that she made for interning them, essentially, was the right decision. Was it the right decision? No. Is it ever the right decision? No. But. Isperia as the grand arbiter or the, the head judge or the high judge or whatever, at the time, she thought it was the right call. And just because Veraska is in her face now explaining to her how it felt to be on the receiving end of it, to me, I can see how Isperia would not think that that was a compelling enough argument. I can't. That's fair. Sorry. No, that's fair. Like you said, it's never the right decision. I, uh, I guess my point is, I don't think you're wrong. I just, I can understand where Isperia is coming from. It doesn't mean I think Isperia is right. It just means I can understand why she feels that she's right. And, and as an Azorius and a, a, a leader of the Azorius as she is, it also makes perfect sense to me that she wouldn't even hesitate when Veraska asked her. Are you upset? You know, if you had the opportunity, would you do it again? Are you, are, are you remorseful for what you did? And Isperia just says no. Yeah, because I, I she's have, not. I have no concept of how you could look someone in the eye and say that. 
Especially, well, not even just someone, but someone who... Unless you have a fucking <laughs> death wish and nothing else. <laughs> well, and... Because uh, you fucking deserve to die if you're going to say that. Okay. And that, again... Nope. I'm the most surprised, I guess... Yeah. <laughs> I think I think she felt, she being Isperia, felt that she was doing the right thing at that time, and still, up until the moment of her death, felt that she was doing the right thing as well. Okay. So do the right thing and then die for it. She did. And... <sighs> because you deserve to. And sorry. That, and that, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> interestingly, that moment at the end, once we go back to Rawl, and they walk through the doors and see Isperia, and everyone's in shock and panicking and whatever, and Dovin Bon is the first one to step up and, and say, don't worry, everybody, it's fine, you're under our protection. He tells the guards what to do. There are two different things that I thought of for why that could have happened. One, he knew what, that, what they were going to find inside of that room. So he was not surprised by it. Because again, arguably, he was the one that slipped that note to Veraska and was the one that made the guards at the entrance to the, uh, the room go away. Because he would be the one with the ability to do that. Of course, Bolas could have mind-controlled them. So right. it could have just been a, a, a Bolas puppet who had right. done it. But my... My thoughts are more on Dovin Bon. Again, arguably also a Bolas puppet, although right. not mind controlled, but doing the right. bidding of Nicol Bolas. Just a smart, <laughs> conniving right. Bolas puppet. And again, speaking of smart and conniving, the second option that I thought of was with Dovin's ability to see the weakness in any strategy or whatever, that he would be the first one to be done processing quickly enough to be like, okay, you two have to go this way. Everybody else, you have to stay calm. Stop panicking. Like, so I think, and honestly, I don't know which is more plausible to me. I think the first one, but I also I think, think... the second one. Well, because I was going to say, I, and I agree with you only because, or I see your point only because I think it would be very stupid of Dovin Bon, the guy who is then eventually going to become the leader of the Azorius after this, to just immediately be like not phased at all by the fact that she's dead and just start ordering okay, people around and take right and okay. taking control take charge right away so that you can really really stir up um suspicion right. against yourself right uh, as to her murder right but Let's... it gets a lot easier when you take into account the fact that she was turned to stone so everyone's like, well, the Gorgon... Well, and especially, know. right, and also also because Veraska's then not there. Right. Clearly Veraska's not going to walk back into the chamber the next morning surrounded by characters like Borborygmos and Aurelia and, you know, people that could kill her without a half a second thought right. behind it, you know. Um, but yeah, I, and again, talking about, you know, Dovin Bond knowing flaws and plans, that's why I think you're correct that it is the... The second option of just he processed it quickly enough as opposed to he knew and was just like, okay, well, this happened. Now time to start my script. You know, this time to start reading the script I had planned. So, uh, but that's this story. And it, it ends with that little bit of hope of, of Rawl kind of giving us another mystery to follow. Right. Of, you know, him thinking about, as you mentioned, the ley lines of magic going through all the different guilds and uh, etc. And we're going to have to see what that brings in later jars because for now we're done yeah we're totally done with this one so thank you all so very much for watching there was a lot that we talked about in this one Too um, much. <laughs> yeah fair uh but any and all points that you want to bring up that you want to discuss that you want to agree with disagree with start a conversation continue a conversation that's what the comments are for as amy very nicely and correctly pointed out um, so please feel free to do so. That would help us out uh, by, you know, talking in the comments. But it's also important for all of you. Talk to each other. And all of that is examples of the community coming together and showing off our... Hashtag Vorthos Pride. That's right. Very, very important. So that is going to be the end of another episode of JAR here on Now the Geek for All Family of channels please feel free to check out the other channel as well the subscriptions things will pop up here feel free to tap or click those um other videos check those out as well helps us out quite a bit and hopefully genuinely you enjoy them because 
That is also important if this is your thing, uh, if you're a Magic fan and also a Hearthstone fan, there are also some Hearthstone videos on that video game channel. So go check those out as well. But as I said, from the Geek for All family of channels, I have been Joe. And I'm Amy. And as we always say, in whichever video of ours you watch next, we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody.